president's car is now turning onto Elm Street, and it will be only a matter of minutes before he arrives at the trademark. I was on Simmons Freeway earlier, and even the freeway was jam-packed with spectators waiting their chance to see the president as he made his way toward the trademark. It, it, it appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. There's numerous people running up the hill alongside Elm Street, there by the Simmons Freeway. Several police officers are rushing up the hill at this time. Stand by just a moment, please. On November the 22nd, 1963, at 12.30, the whole system of the American form of government collapsed when John Kennedy was assassinated. Parkland Hospital, there has been a shooting. Parkland Hospital has been advised to stand by for a severe gunshot wound. I repeat, a shooting in the motorcade in the downtown area. Parkland Hospital has been advised to stand by for a severe gunshot wound. If you can show a fourth bullet, then Lee Harvey Oswald did not do it alone. The president's car is now going past me. The limousine is now traveling at a very high rate of speed. Secret Service men standing up in the limousine. They are armed with submachine guns. It appears as though someone in the limousine might have been hit by the gunfire. If Lee Harvey Oswald did not do it alone or did not kill the president of the United States, then there was a conspiracy to kill the president of the United States. The presidential car coming up now. We know it's the presidential car. You can see Mrs. Kennedy's pink suit. There's a Secret Service man, Spread Eagle, over the top of the car. We understand Governor and Mrs. Connolly are in the car with President and Mrs. Kennedy. We can't see who has been hit, if anybody's been hit, but apparently something is wrong. Look at who benefited by his death, and then one can reach a reasonable conclusion as to who might have been part of his assassination. The Secret Service man is still Spread Eagle over whoever is in the car. The FBI, the CIA, the Mafia, the, 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 the Cuban connections, the anti, the pro-Cuban, uh, the, all of these uh, were active, secretly. So they all benefited by his death. Mrs. Kennedy, and as we understand, Governor and Mrs. Connolly. At this point, it looks as though it could have been one or two or even all of the people within the car may have been the victims, may have been struck by shots. We don't know. The war in Vietnam continued on for another 11 years. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Paul Wright and welcome to the tragic and fascinating story of the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the 35th President of the United States. Today we talk with celebrated JFK assassination expert Vincent Lavery. We begin by investigating why JFK visited Dallas in Texas on November 22nd, 1963 in the first place. Over to Vincent Lavery. Robert Kennedy was... John Kennedy's attorney general and was a very close advisor. As a matter of fact, John Kennedy's closest advisor on political strategy. In uh, September of 1963, Robert Kennedy told the president that he would be in trouble in the, in the 64 election if he didn't visit Texas and unite the party. The party was split between the left under Senator Ralph Yarborough and the right under Governor John Connolly. So that is the reason he went to Texas. He went to Texas on his brother's advice that he needed to um, visit the state to bring the two factions together or as Robert Kennedy said, if you don't, you're going to lose Texas, and 64 is going to be a very close election. Therefore, you better get down there and unite these two factions. He was told by many people not to go to Texas, uh, amongst them Billy Graham. The, the Reverend Billy Graham uh, uh, said, don't go. Why would he have said that, though, Reverend Billy Graham? Be well, the reason 
Billy Graham and uh, Senator Fulbright of Arkansas and Senator Scott, of, uh, Republican of Pennsylvania, suggested he, he shouldn't go to Dallas was that earlier the Chief Justice of the United States, Earl Warren, had been physically attacked in Dallas and Adlai Stevenson, the United States Ambassador to the United Nations, had been physically attacked in Dallas. Uh, so they, they told him not to go because they feared for his safety. His response to that was, if, if I, John Kennedy, as President of the United States, I can't visit every part of this nation, then there's something wrong with my presidency. Because of the unfortunate incident which occurred here during the visit of Ambassador Stevenson, people everywhere in the world will be hypercritical of our behavior. Nothing must occur that is disrespectful or degrading to the President of the United States. And so he went to Texas, and it was the first time in the thousand days of his uh, presidency that Jackie Kennedy, his wife, joined him. It wasn't known at the time, of course, but there was marital problems between the two of them at the time, but the public uh, was not aware uh, of this fact. And uh, it was so important that he unite uh, the left wing and the right wing of the Democratic Party in Texas that Jackie Kennedy accompanied him uh, to Dallas on November the 22nd, 1963. The image of Jackie Kennedy, uh, the, uh, her image being of gentleness and ballet and poetry and music and arts and languages, and John Kennedy's portrayal of himself as a macho uh, PT-109 skipper who saved people in the China in the China Sea or, and a uh, football player, mountain climber, and all of these things led to a, a marvelous image when both of them were together. And so she joined him, and as a matter of fact, one of his comments on the 21st of November where he was in Fort Worth, he reminded the public that when he was in Paris a few months earlier addressing the French government, that he said, oh, incidentally, members of the French government, my name is John Kennedy. I am the man who accompanied Jackie Kennedy to Paris this morning, simply because she was getting all the attention and they were interested in what she was wearing. But as Kennedy said, no one ever asked me or Lyndon Johnson what we were. Ladies and gentlemen, two years ago, I said that uh, introduced myself in Paris by saying that I was the man who had accompanied uh, Mrs. Kennedy to Paris. I'm getting that somewhat that same sensation uh, as I travel around uh, Texas. <laughs> Nobody wonders what Lyndon and I wear. But <laughs> so it was very important, as I said, to bring these two factions together. Uh, John Kennedy uh, flew into Fort Worth, Texas on November the 21st, 1963 with Jackie Kennedy and the next morning they took the short flight to Dallas. The Air Force One arrived at the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth airport and he immediately got into his 1961 Lincoln convertible. And this, this was the famous, famous open top one, Vincent, which we all, we've all seen uh, footage of uh, from the famous footage from those uh, very important days. Yeah, and uh, as a matter of fact, he, he ordered that the bubble on the limousine be taken off. Once again, the theory that he espoused to was that the president had to be readily available to the public to be seen and and to be touched and to be uh, not closeted away behind um, stone walls or steel limousine covers. So it was a beautiful day, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the, there was 100-plus thousand people out in the streets to greet them. Uh, there was a marvelous welcome. Uh, other than uh, a flyer that was handed out, 
and billboards that showed a mug shot of John Kennedy, front face and side face, similar to what would be taken at a police lineup. And underneath it said, wanted for treason, selling out to the communists. And it listed several reasons why he should be charged with treason. Uh, th- these billboards and flyers were paid for by extreme right-wing uh, uh, family in, in, in Dallas, the Hunt family. And, but other than that, there was a um, marvelous uh, welcome forum. He got into the L- Lincoln convertible and uh, sat in the rear right seat, and Jackie Kennedy in the in the rear left. In the jump seat in the front of John Kennedy would have been the governor, John Connolly, and to his left, his wife, and two Secret Service agents, uh, Greer and Kellerman, who were driving the uh, presidential sedan. Now well, the motorcade will very shortly start to move out. Secret Service men, the car behind. Uh, then comes the Vice President, and Mrs. Johnson, Senator Yarborough. They came down Main Street, and um, your listeners need a little theater of the of the mind here. Uh, Main Street runs east and west, so they're going west on Main Street. They were going to come into an area called the Dealey Plaza area, which was three streets. Uh, Main Street would converge into Houston Street, and to the east of um, uh, Main Street was Elm Street, and to the south was um, Commerce Street. When they met, when they came to Houston Street, the automobile was to turn right on Houston, and then make a sharp left on Elm, uh, in front of the Texas School Book Depository Building, and. As they rounded the corner, ironically, uh, from Maine to Houston, heading towards Elm Street, um, Mrs. Connolly leaned over and said to uh, the president, you can't say, Mrs. Uh, Mr. President, that Dallas doesn't love you. Dallas police out here in force today doing a beautiful job of handling the crowd. And with that, the automobile continued on. Uh, There were not that many people in the Dealey Plaza area. It was the end of Main Street. He was heading out to the Trade Mart where he was going to talk to the Chamber of Commerce uh, before he gave his final speech in Austin, Texas, and then would have flown back to Washington, D.C. And as the automobile turned left on Elm Street, uh, it was doing about 12 miles an hour, it uh, went down the hill to go under the underpass to get onto the Stemmons Freeway. On the right corner of Elm and Houston, there were at least three oak trees. And uh, 50 yards ahead was a road sign about uh, five feet in height which said uh, Stemmons Freeway a quarter of a mile. Uh, To the uh, right of the road sign was a grassy area where people would come out of the government buildings adjacent to the Dealey Plaza, and they would sit and have their lunch there. And at the back of the Dealey Plaza, there was a wooden wicker fence separating the grassy park sitting area for the public, from a parking lot which led into the railroads and the um, rail traffic control building. On the corner of Elm and Houston was a seven-story building, the Texas School Book Depository building. The Texas School Book Depository building, as its name indicates, housed the textbooks for the city and county of Dallas for the public schools. The president's car is now turning onto Elm Street, and it will be only a matter of minutes before he arrives at the trademark. I was on Stemmons Freeway earlier, and even the freeway was jam-packed. At uh, 12.30, uh, shots were fired. This 
it, it appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. There's numerous people running up the hill alongside Elm Street, there by the Simmons Freeway. Several police officers are rushing up the hill at this time. Stand by just a moment, please. Something has happened in the motorcade route. Stand by, please. And uh, standing uh, between the, the Stems Freeway road sign and the Wicker Friends fence was a New York gentleman who had just moved to Dallas by the name of Abraham Zapruder. Uh, Abraham Zapruder was in the clothing business and uh, had heard that the president's limousine was coming by the Dealey Plaza area and got his 8mm movie camera, a bell and howl, and stood up on the uh, ramp and uh, photographed in uh, living color the complete assassination of the president. The Abram Zapruder movie is about 28 seconds long and it shows the automobile uh, taking the turn from Houston Street onto Elm Street. And uh, for a little over a half a second, the automobile goes out of sight when it passes in front of the road sign indicating to the Stemmons Freeway. Uh, when, the, when John Kennedy is uh, out of sight behind that for, uh, during that half second, um, when he reappears, uh, both of his hands are going for his throat. So he's obviously been hit. The, the Abraham Zapparuder movie go, moves at 18 and a half frames per second. Uh, approximately um, a second and a half later, uh, Governor Connolly is seen to be hit. And on frame 313, John Kennedy is clearly hit. Uh, you can see the halo of blood and tissue around his head. And as the automobile continues on, uh, the Zapruder movie clearly shows Jackie Kennedy endeavoring to climb out of the car uh, as it speeds up to, uh, heading towards now the Parkland Hospital. Parkland Hospital has been advised to stand by for a severe gunshot wound. The president's car is now going past me. The limousine is now traveling at a very high rate of speed. Secret Service men standing up in the limousine. They are armed with submachine guns. It appears as though someone in the limousine might have been hit by the gunfire. As the automobile speeds up, uh, Jackie Kennedy is climbing onto the, the hood, onto the trunk of the car. And uh, Hill, a Secret Service agent, jumps on the back and uh, actually pushes her back into the automobile. Had he not done that, she, well, may have been injured or if not killed. The presidential car coming up now. We know it's the presidential car. You can see Mrs. Kennedy's pink suit. There's a Secret Service man spread eagle over the top of the car. We understand Governor and Mrs. Connolly are in the car with President and Mrs. Kennedy. We can't see who has been hit, if anybody's been hit, but apparently something is wrong here. Something is terribly wrong. The automobile speeds up and uh, continues on into Parkland Hospital where Kennedy is put on a gurney and wheeled into uh, Trauma Room 1 and Connolly is uh, wheeled into Trauma Room 2. At 1 o'clock an announcement is made that the President of the United States has, been, has died and uh, that Governor Connolly is in serious condition but uh, would survive. A flash from Dallas. Two priests who were with President Kennedy say he is dead of bullet wounds. This is the latest information we have from Dallas. We are, of course, standing by to give you all available information as it comes to us. I will repeat with the greatest regret this flash. Two priests who were with President Kennedy say he has died of bullet wounds. Uh, so, with the, with the shots fired and with um, the death of the President, um, Lyndon Johnson, uh, who is the Vice President, is sworn in aboard Air Force One 
at approximately 2.30 that afternoon. And a little footnote to history, the, the judge who swore him in constitutionally and legally uh, was not uh, entitled to swear uh, the president in because she was a, a state judge. It would require a federal judge to swear the president in, but uh, that little bit of history is just a, a footnote and of, of some kind of interest for those people who like those sort of little idiosyncrasies in the history books. Then, Frank, we now have this. The presidential plane is airborne. It has left Love Field in Dallas, carrying President Lyndon Johnson to Washington. Mr. Johnson was sworn in, we have a correction in the time, less than an hour ago at 3.39 Eastern Standard Time as President of the United States. He was sworn in by a district judge, Sarah Hughes, aboard the presidential plane parked at Love Field, where it had come in earlier this morning to Dallas and deposited then-President Kennedy and his party. At the swearing-in of Lyndon Bain Johnson as President of the United States were Mrs. Kennedy, the late President's widow, and Mrs. Johnson, now the First Lady of the land, several staff members and several congressmen, apparently those who had been in the presidential party for this swing into Texas. Mr. Johnson asked as many White House people as possibly could to crowd into the executive suite of the airplane, Air Force One, to witness the ceremony. Judge Hughes, who administered the oath, is said to have been weeping while she swore Mr. Johnson in as President of the United States. The first order that Lyndon Johnson gives as President of the United States is, um, let's get out of here. The plane takes off and heads to Washington, D.C. Uh, aboard the plane is the coffin of um, President John Kennedy. Jackie Kennedy is aboard the plane too. And it can, t with the arrival of the plane the um, in Washington DC the the coffin is taken to Bethesda Naval Hospital and seven days later President Johnson creates a commission to look into the investigation of uh, why Kennedy was killed. Uh, there was a seven-person commission headed by the Chief Justice of the United States, Earl Warren, and Earl Warren actually told the President that he did not want to head the commission. But Johnson, being the very persuasive man he was, he grabbed Warren literally by both shoulders and said, you have a, uh, an obligation to your country to head this commission. As Chief Justice of the United States, you are looked upon as unbiased and impartial. Why would Warren have not wanted to be uh, head of that commission, uh, Vincent? Well, yeah, it, it was just he didn't want the responsibility. He uh, he, uh, he he wanted to stay away from from the uh, what it would necessitate to head that commission. But uh, he changed his mind after being persuaded by Johnson, and um, the members of the commission were told in a quiet kind of way by the president that. I want this report out as soon as possible. Uh, the, the election, November 1964, uh, in so many words, he was saying, I don't want it to come out in late October, a few days before the election. Try to get it out sooner, so by election time, uh, people will not be, probably will not be paying that much attention to the findings. The commission, of course, was charged with the responsibility of finding out why Lee Harvey Oswald killed the president, not who did kill the president because the world had already made up its mind that the 24-year-old Lee Harvey Oswald, who was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, and had enlisted in the United States Marine Corps, got an early discharge to go back to New Orleans to help his mother, and had recently moved to Dallas, where he got a job working in the Texas School Book Depository building, that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald had assassinated the President of the United States. Madness and hate erupt anew in Dallas as President Kennedy's accused assassin is shot down himself during a jail transfer. There's an ominous symbol in Lee Harvey Oswald's murder weapon as he is taken to the city jail basement where an armored car is to move him to a maximum security cell. Oswald walks his last mile. His assailant moves in from the right. 
Now, from another camera, the motion is slowed. The murderer moves in, and here is the shame of all America as Jack Rubenstein takes the law unto himself. The dying Oswald is rushed to the same hospital where President Kennedy died. Doctors work to save his life. But 48 hours and 7 minutes after the president's death, his accused slayer is dead. Uh, so the, once again, the, it's key to remember that uh, the, the world, for all practical purposes, uh, had, uh, had concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald had killed the president and that the responsibility of the commission was to find out why he did it and what could be done to prevent future assassination attempts. The commission um, <clears throat> issued its findings in September of '64. And it's the Warren Report Commission uh, book is 880 plus pages, uh, along with 26 volumes of exhibits and statements. The 26 volumes are available uh, in um, major libraries across the United States, and the Warren Report Commission, of course, can be probably found in any library in Ireland. The Commission had much controversy within its ranks as to how to word its findings. Uh, one of the members of the Commission was a, the Congressman from Michigan at that time, Gerald Ford, who later, of course, was to become President. And the findings were that Lee Harvey Oswald had killed the President of the United States, that he used one gun, this gun fired three bullets from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository building and that one man was responsible for the assassination, Lee Harvey Oswald. Using one gun, fired three bullets from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository building, uh, caves closed. So that, that, that was the government's findings. And to discover just how valid those findings were and what occurred next in the story of the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, then don't miss Vincent Lavery talking in the next number two program in this three part series. Until then, from myself, Paul Wright, bye for now. developments in the story surrounding yesterday's assassination of President Kennedy. Homicide Captain Will Fritz of Dallas told us just a few moments ago, this case is cinched. I cannot say more about the evidence, but the case is cinched. This is the man who killed President Kennedy. Has he confessed, sir? Has made a statement? He has not confessed. He has made no statement. Charges of murder have been accepted against him. Here comes Oswald down the hall again. You buy that rifle. The dispatch that you people have been given, but I emphatically deny these charges. Oswald has hustled uh, through a doorway. It was a calculating man who slew the president of these United States today. He had to be. The shots that killed the president and severely wounded the governor of Texas came from a predetermined spot a clear view of the motorcade as it passed. These people have given me a hearing without legal representation or anything. Did you shoot the president? I didn't shoot anybody, no, sir. I didn't shoot anybody, no, sir. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country.